During World War II, a vast complex of secret bunkers was constructed under the streets of London. This world, now lost to time, was once an important refuge from the nightly onslaught of Nazi air raids. This subterranean labyrinth kept the British government, led by Prime Minister Winston Churchill, safe through the darkest days of the war. It's the most dangerous place in the world, it's the most dramatic place in the world, and at the centre of it all is Churchill, who actually is himself in the firing line. This secret network also sheltered American General Dwight Eisenhower, but very little else has ever been revealed to the public. This is an immense effort that never before had been set up in the history of wartime. And it's done while most people above never realize what is happening. Now we head underground and bring this lost world back to life. We will use cutting edge computer graphic technology to peel back the layers and reveal a hidden city. Deep below the sidewalk, we will expose wartime secrets we were never meant to know. London is one of the world's most densely populated cities, and yet few people have any idea that a secret world lies beneath her streets. Built during World War II to shelter Winston Churchill and Dwight Eisenhower, this underground government complex actually had its origins in an earlier conflict. During the First World War, Zeppelins and Gotha bombers attacked London in large quantities and dropped bombs on civilian targets. This was a shocking occurrence, and it gave Britain a kind of pervasive fear of what aerial bombardment could do to them. For the British, the rise of Nazi Germany brought all these fears back. During the 1920s, Churchill had thought that, that no war was going to be possible, but when Hitler came to power, he saw the increasing possibility of war. He recognized the beast um, in, in Germany. He, he, he had a, a very acute understanding of what Hitler could do, and in particular, he recognized the threat that the Luftwaffe would pose to Britain. Hitler's aggressive foreign policy led to paranoia in London. The British believed a new war would lead to the dropping of bombs and poison gas on their city. London needed bomb-proof and gas-tight shelters. But building such structures was an unknown science. Civil engineers and architects were recruited to help with air raid planning. At the outset of the war, anyone trying to design or build a bomb-resistant structure was really getting into very unfamiliar territory. One fundamental question really was whether to shelter underground or overground, and um, it's interesting that in Germany at the time they produced designs for some very large, heavily fortified above-ground shelters. But British engineers, influenced by the trench experience of World War I, developed their own ideas. They would build below ground. Those ideas and, and developments from them are beautifully illustrated in a, a set of cartoons that were put together by Ovarup, the great engineer at that time. Starting with an open trench, the defenses got progressively deeper and more elaborate. Solid walls and reinforced roofs proved capable of protecting people in large numbers. But not everybody wanted to go below ground. Churchill disliked the idea of hiding underground. He always had done in the First World War. He despised it. He regarded it as a sort of form of cowardice, and he would think of bunkers as sort of funk holes, not what he wanted to do. And the first of these funk holes that was suggested to him was a place codenamed Paddock. Paddock was the brainchild of Norman Hollis, secretary of the Committee on Imperial Defense. In 1938, he was asked to find the government a suitable bomb and gas-proof bunker. After scouring basements, tunnels, and disused subway stations all over London, he settled on a cluster of buildings in the suburbs, four miles from Parliament. This was the post office research station. It was the perfect mask for a top-secret government installation. 
To this day, it remains largely ignored by the public. None of the existing buildings was large enough or suitable for reinforcement, so in February 1939, Hollis ordered the construction of a 50-room emergency bunker. Excavation went 40 feet down. Then the bunkers were built on two levels. The foundations, walls, and ceilings were all made from reinforced concrete. The building was covered and then hidden with the construction of innocuous civilian buildings. Paddock was one of the great secrets of the war. Lost under suburban homes and gardens, it was eventually discovered by amateur detectives. We can now enter the shelter some 60 years after the government ordered it sealed. Right, this is the emergency cabinet war room. This is where the government would have come from Whitehall in the event of an attack on central London. Here, they should have been able to withstand a direct hit from the largest high-explosive bomb that the Germans had available. We're going down to the first level of the bunker, about 15 feet. At this point, we're coming into an airlock. One of the major uh, worries was of a gas attack. The airlock worked because the air pressure in the bunker was kept higher than the pressure outside. If someone entered the bunker from outside, the airlock would be sealed and the high pressure would force any gas back out. The way would be clear for people to enter the bunker safely. Poison gas was a very serious factor in the government's calculations and they produced millions upon millions of gas masks. At the beginning of the war, about 85% of the population could be seen in the streets with their gas masks. It was such a, a real fear. Despite the enormity of this bunker, it was built to house 200 people. Paddock was constructed in complete secrecy. Most work was done at night under camouflage netting. The vast quantities of spoil from the excavation were allegedly removed in bread delivery vans, and local people knew not to ask any questions. No one wanted to be suspected as a spy. Now, we're moving into the inner sanctum of the bunker. The basement where we are now uh, could have been sacrificed, but downstairs in the sub-basement, uh, that's where the government would have been, that's where Churchill would have been. There are three ways down, and each of them is protected by a heavy steel blast door. You turn the wheel and thick metal bars would have pushed into these openings here. So this would have been gas-tight and blast-proof. As we go down the stairs, this is floor level, and between this floor level here and the, the sub-basement, there's five feet of reinforced concrete to give added blast protection down in the sub-basement. As the bunker was designed to operate in the most extreme of wartime conditions, it had to be self-sufficient. In case it was cut off from main supplies by an air raid, it had its own water tanks. There was a generator capable of running everything from the lighting, teleprinters and radio equipment to the ventilation and filtration plant. Paddock did not have a heating system. It was assumed that the warmth of 200 bodies would have been sufficient to heat the sealed bunker. The trade-off would have been a humid and foul-smelling atmosphere. However unpleasant, Paddock had a vital role to play when war finally broke out in 1939. London braced itself for Hitler's bombs. As soon as Britain was at war with Germany, an air raid siren went off in London. It was a false alarm as it happened, but you've got an instant terror, hence the wearing of gas masks, hence the evacuation of people, hence the moving of large quantities of the population into bunkers. The bombers didn't come at first, but the fear of invasion remained. Should central London be evacuated, Paddock would be at the heart of Britain's resistance to the Nazis. Right, we're coming into the map room here. This is the military hub of the bunker. This is where the war in Britain would have been run from. There would have been maps on all these walls here. And fluorescent light fittings angle the light onto these walls where the maps were located. 
you've got three offices, perhaps one for each of the services, the Admiralty, the Air Force, the Army. This is a vitally important room. This is where the war could have been won or lost. In the end, the order to evacuate London was never given. Paddock remained on permanent standby. Churchill did, in fact, hold one cabinet meeting at Paddock, but it's a, it was an impossible place to get at. The cabinet got lost as they went there, and he dismissed it as a piece of useless folly, quite unsuitable for His Majesty's government. Although it never fully served its purpose, Paddock was important. It helped engineers understand how to build bomb shelters, and it served as a prototype for many of Churchill's bunkers. With Hitler's armies triumphant in Western Europe, it was inevitable that he would direct his bombers at London. What happened in one of these bunkers would save Britain. Hidden deep in the corner of an Air Force base in London, England, is a top secret military bunker. 60 years ago, it was the hub of Britain's air defenses, tasked with stopping the most dangerous threat the country had faced in a thousand years. By the summer of 1940, Hitler's armies had smashed their way through Holland and Belgium and had occupied Paris in France. He now set his sights on Britain, just a short distance across the water. Britain was in huge danger in the summer of 1940. The Germans threatened to bomb us into submission. They were massing on the continent. They were assembling barges. Hitler had planned an operation which he called Operation Sealan, which was set for the 15th of September 1940. And the British thought that invasion was a real possibility. Hitler now had charge over French airfields just 20 miles from the British coast. His bombers and fighters could now reach London, and their lethal payloads were forcing both the public and the government to seek shelter where they could. His plan was to destroy Britain's air force and leave the island open to invasion. RAF Fighter Command was a prime target, and if it was to survive the assault of the Luftwaffe, it would have to go underground. These two items are both World War II German bombs. They both weigh 1,000 kilograms. That's round about 2,000 pounds. This item here is a blast weapon. About 80% of this weapon contains explosives. Blast weapons exploded upon impact and caused maximum damage above ground. They were easily countered by underground bunkers, but such shelters were extremely vulnerable to another weapon in Hitler's arsenal. This particular weapon is called an ESAW. It's a penetrating weapon designed to penetrate bunkers or hardened targets. It's got this trunnion strap system, which means it's gonna be used by dive bombers that can accurately hit the target. 80% of this weapon is steel, only 20% explosive. Although it contained little explosive, the pencil shape and extreme weight of a penetration bomb meant that it could burrow through metal, brick, or concrete before detonating at high pressure deep in the ground. The original Bunker Buster. The only response to these penetrating bombs was to take the bunkers deeper underground. Churchill was enormously excited by warfare, and the warfare that was going on in the summer of 1940 was the Battle of Britain, the airborne assault on Britain and the bombing, which got slowly nearer and nearer London. And Churchill, he liked to do this, he liked to go to the front. And the front line during the Battle of Britain was in the underground headquarters at Uxbridge. Uxbridge was one of a new generation of top-secret deep-level bunkers that lay far below the range of German weapons. With special military permission, we can now head down 60 feet to the operations room of London's Fighter Command. In the summer of 1940, this room offered Britain a lifeline. 
Buried deep in an open excavation, the Uxbridge bunker is a simple thick-walled box on substantial concrete foundations. For added protection, a six-foot slab of reinforced concrete was laid on top. Two exit passageways were constructed, and then the hole was filled with sand and earth. It was designed to be virtually invisible from the air. The bunker comprised 40 rooms over two levels. It was completely self-sufficient with its own generators, ventilation system, and telecommunications. But the crowning glory of this underground command center was the plotting room. Ready for action as war was declared, Uxbridge was for a time the most important operations room in Britain. The prime minister was a frequent visitor. Joan Fanshawe, serving in the bunker in 1940, secretly recorded his visits. It was quite against all rules and regulations to keep a diary, but I kept one throughout the war, and I used to hide it in my gas mask container. One particular visit stands out. September the 15th. I was on duty till nearly one because Churchill was upstairs and we could not change over in a blitz. That blitz was to prove the heaviest daylight raid of the war. On September 15th, 1940, London held its breath. 200 heavily armed German bombers were approaching. And if Hitler could destroy Churchill's air defenses, the path to invasion lay open. All records of sightings were channeled into the plotting room. First reports of German aircraft came from radar stations on the coast. These were then translated into map positions by plotters like Joan. If they were enemy aircraft, it would say H, hostile, and it would say how many aircraft there were and at what height they were flying. As soon as they touched the coast, the Observer Corps took over and picked up the aircraft, and they passed them to Fighter Command Headquarters. The station controller reacted to the latest information. He sent up fighter squadrons to intercept the German raiders. Churchill knew it was make or break. This was the pivotal day of the Battle of Britain. Churchill sat there absolutely enthralled as the plotters pushed the indicators across the board and as the lights lit up to show the Germans coming and the British squadrons rising to fight them. You can imagine it would become extremely busy because then we come across our own squadrons here. 303 has come from North Holt, and that means there are 22 aircraft in it flying at 22,000 feet. So the controller could get them up to the right height to oppose the enemy aircraft coming in. Facing over 200 German aircraft, Uxbridge threw everything it had into the fray. It became almost impossible to find space to put these blocks all together. And the plots were all getting mixed up and you'd get mixed up with your person next door. It was a madhouse, it was really was. At one crucial moment during this extraordinarily tense, dramatic time, Air Vice Marshal Park, who was in charge of the whole operation, told him that there were no more reserves. Every available fighter plane was committed to the battle. Both the British and the Germans suffered heavily through the day. There were wild claims from each side over the number of planes shot down. Churchill was intensely moved by the Uxbridge experience, and he went home excited, elated, exhausted, thinking that the British claims that we had shot down 185 German aircraft was correct. It wasn't correct. We'd shot down about a third of that, about 60. Nevertheless, it was the culmination of the Battle of Britain, something that he had witnessed at first hand. And it marked the end, really, of the German attempt to attack Britain by air during the daylight. 
the secret bunker at Uxbridge was never discovered by the Germans. Without it, fighter command might have been wiped out. Because of it, Britain retained control of the skies. Hitler abandoned his plans for invasion and switched his tactics from attacking the Air Force to bombing civilians. Churchill and his government would now be in the firing line. They were in urgent need of a bomb-proof bunker in central London. There began one of the most incredible secret construction projects of the war. Under this building in central London is a massive bunker. With over 200 rooms, it would be the hub of Winston Churchill's wartime world. With German bombers wreaking destruction on London, this secret underground complex would provide a refuge for Churchill and his government in the most desperate of times. London becomes a, a, a most extraordinary focus for world attention. It's the most dangerous place in the world, it's the most dramatic place in the world, and at the center of it all is Churchill, who actually is himself in the firing line. When the Blitz began, there were loud calls to evacuate the government from London. But Churchill feared this would lead to widespread panic. He resolved to stay in the capital and see it through with his people. Churchill enjoyed the bombing. It was a kind of huge pyrotechnic display. And sometimes in his tin hat, he would go up onto the roof of what is now the Treasury and look at this splendid firework display, puffing away at his cigar throughout. He realized, of course, the horror of it. But always in him, there was a kind of schoolboy. There was a delight in the drama of action and warfare. But when his own home took a direct hit, Churchill reluctantly accepted the need for bomb-proof quarters. Just 100 yards from the Houses of Parliament, a substantial government building with extensive basements was identified as being perfect for Churchill's needs. On the first floor would be his living quarters. The basement would provide protected office space for political and military leaders, and down in the sub-basement, sleeping quarters for his staff. For many years, the cabinet war rooms were a closely guarded secret, but studies of declassified papers now reveal the full story. This is the way that Churchill and those coming to work in the cabinet war rooms or to visit the cabinet war rooms would have arrived at the building and you would have walked up this staircase. And ahead of them, they would have seen a pair of gas doors. As they got close, they would have noticed that there was a small hole in the middle with a machine gun pointing out through it. Guarded by heavily armed Marines, the suite of first floor rooms provided for the Prime Minister was known as the Annex. At one end were Churchill's private map rooms. At the other was his living quarters, a dining room, a living room, and a bedroom each for Mr. and Mrs. Churchill. But these rooms were not safe from bombs. With Hitler intensifying his night attacks on London in late 1940, Churchill and his government took shelter in the basement rooms below. These offered some protection, but they were still not bomb-proof. Substantial reinforcement was ordered. What followed was one of the most amazing secret construction projects of the war, the erection of a bomb-proof slab over the basement cabinet war rooms. Although they started to reinforce the cabinet war rooms by putting in timber uh, structure, Eventually, they changed it to putting in a steel structure, but uh, that wasn't considered safe enough. And so eventually, they started to build a massive concrete detonator slab, which was thought to be proof against 250 kilogram bombs. The principle of the detonator slab was very simple. A thick crust of concrete lay above the basement. Rather than penetrate it, a bomb would explode, and the rooms below would be shielded. But the engineering was more complex. If you imagine a bomb falling from maybe 15,000 feet, it can reach a speed of 
a thousand feet per second, so that's an awful lot of kinetic energy hitting the roof of the shelter. So to actually deal with that and have a slab of some sort that will resist that sort of impact is, is a big engineering challenge. I'm sure a lot of trial and error went into establishing the necessary thickness to defeat the, the largest of the bombs that might be uh, directed at, a, at an important target. The slab was laid over a framework of steel beams cut into the walls of the ground floor. In complete secrecy, some 900 beams, each weighing over a ton, were lifted by hand into the building. On these beams, a bed of corrugated troughs was laid. Then six feet of liquid concrete was pumped in. Eventually, an area the size of a football field was covered. In this exposed section of the slab, you can see the thickness of concrete. You can also see the troughing uh, which supports the concrete, and then the steel beams underneath. This enormous construction project took 18 months to complete. Work carried on 24 hours a day around Churchill and his government. And while he hated the constant banging and whistling of the workmen, the Prime Minister's fascination in their work was noted in his secretary's diary. The PM appeared, and bidding me bring a torch, led me away to look at the girders in the basement, intended to support the building. With astonishing agility, he climbed over girders, balanced himself on their upturned edges, some five feet above ground, and leapt from one to another without any sign of undue effort. Extraordinary in a man of almost 66, who never takes exercise of any sort. Eventually, some 200 rooms were reinforced for government use. Of primary importance to Churchill was the Cabinet War Room. He regularly met here with his ministers and military commanders to discuss strategy. It was in this room that some of the greatest decisions of World War II were made. But none of those decisions could have been made without up-to-the-minute intelligence reports which came from the map room. This was the nerve center of the basement complex. This is where all the information came in from all the different theaters of war. There were people sitting around this table who were answering the telephone, taking notes, ringing out, giving other people pieces of information. And the whole purpose of it was that daily they could make an assessment of the state of the war. Around a tight cluster of desks, military staff received and passed on the latest information from battle zones around the world. It came in via radio, telephone, and telegraph links. All the information that came in was plotted onto maps. The one on the wall is the convoy map, and you can see from all the thousands of pinholes in it where they were following all the different movements of the ships across the different oceans. There were literally hundreds of maps on the walls, covering up-to-the-minute land and naval operations across the globe. Operating 24-7, irrespective of air raids, the map room was Britain's eye on the world that never slept. There was office space allocated to dozens of secretaries, clerks, telephonists, and guards. The cabinet war rooms could sustain the essential machinery of government underground. And in order to work round the clock, sleeping accommodation was provided. Senior staff enjoyed private quarters at basement level, but the junior staff had to descend 20 feet further, into the dock. This was a claustrophobic warren of rooms in the sub-basement. And it's exactly the same layout of rooms as you had above, but you had a very much uh, shorter headroom, as you can see from this mind your head sign. And so people would come through here and then go off into their dormitories. Just four feet high in places, the dock was damp and infested with rats, but it did at least offer a safe berth away from the bombs. Churchill and his government now considered themselves safe in their basement war rooms, but there was a real danger that the prime minister would be cut off from the outside world. The intense bombing was tearing London's communication system to shreds. One of the first targets that an enemy tries to hit in a war is your communication center. If they can knock out your radio transmitter, if they can knock out your telephone lines, if they can knock out your telegraph, they're gonna do it. 
London's cables were being cut as fast as they could be laid. Churchill was safe in his bunker, but he knew that without communications, he could not direct the war. The remarkable tunnel system that he ordered in response to this threat remains a state secret to this day. One of the great secrets of Churchill's lost world remains under central London today, classified and fully operational. Nightly German bombing raids were tearing the city's communication system to shreds. This secret tunnel network was built deep underground in response. German bombers are trying to take out not only people, they're trying not only to terrorize the population, they're trying to take out the main command and control points that link London with the rest of the world. What's important is not only the population hold out, it's not only important that Churchill survives, but Britain's communications survive the Blitz. If Hitler severed London's telephone, telegraph, and radio networks, Churchill's voice would be cut off from the rest of the world. The fight was on to protect the capital's communications. London's international radio, telegraph, and telephone network stemmed from the Faraday Exchange, the hub of a network of landlines 350,000 miles in length. By securely connecting the cabinet war rooms to Faraday, Churchill would enjoy direct communications with his armed forces and over 70 countries, among them the United States. But Faraday lay over two miles away and cables at street level were vulnerable. Churchill urgently needed a bomb-proof system to get his cables safely across the city, and this spawned a remarkable deep-level tunneling project. Hidden under Whitehall, far below unsuspecting Londoners, lies the first phase of this secret project. Still classified and a potential terrorist target, we can only piece together this tunnel story from fragmentary evidence. We're here in Trafalgar Square, the tourist heart of London. Down there, we have Whitehall, which is the heart of the British government. Under Whitehall is a tunnel, a top secret tunnel built during the Second World War to house and secure the government communications. Building a two mile tunnel from Churchill's war rooms to Faraday was beyond Britain's wartime resources but a shorter 800-yard tunnel was begun between Trafalgar Square and the Houses of Parliament. It would carry government communication cables deep under the street. Initial excavations, 100 feet down in the clay soil, were consolidated by cast iron segments bolted into rings. Section by section, the 12-foot diameter tunnel progressed along Whitehall. It was to carry a total of 40,000 government telephone and telegraph wires toward the national network. Starting in late 1939, miners and engineers protected from air raids worked day and night. They completed the tunnel in just 18 months. As well as cables, the large bore tunnel provided workspace for hundreds of telecoms operators and engineers. But there remained the problem of the last mile and a half to reach the Faraday Exchange. The solution the tunnel engineers found was as simple as it was brilliant. We have a cable tunnel running all the way along Whitehall from Parliament to Trafalgar Square. But that's no use unless it can talk to the rest of the network. In London, we have a large tube network waiting to carry cables. It's called the London Underground. So if you can link from the communications tunnel into the London Underground, you can get pretty much anywhere. The extensive tunnels of the London Underground were perfect for connecting Churchill's communications to the outside world. Cables from the cabinet war rooms fed directly into the Whitehall Tunnel, where they traveled to Trafalgar Square. There, they connected with a tube tunnel heading south under the River Thames. At Waterloo Station, they switched tunnels and headed north again, back under the river. At Faraday Telephone Exchange, they surfaced in a specially constructed shaft. This is Faraday Building. By linking across from Whitehall through the tube tunnels to Faraday, Whitehall was now in touch with the world. 
But getting the cables safely across town was not the end of the story. The Germans understood the significance of Faraday and targeted it heavily. In one night in December 1940, almost 25,000 bombs were dropped in the area. The exchange urgently needed protection. A bunker was planned. But we're not talking about an underground bunker here. We're talking in terms of a citadel, a bomb-proof citadel being built on the surface simply to protect what was inside that, that, that building. A huge concrete fortress began taking shape next to Faraday to house an emergency telephone exchange. Built above ground to save time, it had foundations 10 feet thick with walls and roof to match. It was windowless. Its steel doors weighed four tons and it was gas-proof and bomb-proof. It could hold out for months under attack. Under this formidable concrete shield, government communications were patched into the national network. They were then sent back out of the city via the Underground Railroad. The Whitehall Tunnel and Faraday Citadel were immensely successful in keeping Churchill's communication channels open. As Britain gained allies in Russia and the United States, this was ever more important. But the arrival of American troops in London brought further security risks. In 1942, President Roosevelt sends his commander, the man who will lead Allied forces to retake Europe, General Dwight Eisenhower, here to London to run the war. But London is one of the most dangerous places to be on the face of the earth. How do you protect your commander? There has to be a safe point that will protect Eisenhower and his communications. A new generation of Nazi weapons were set to flatten London. If he was to survive and lead the Allies to victory in Europe, Eisenhower would need a different kind of bunker. Far under central London is the deepest underground bunker built in Britain during World War II. This awesome bomb shelter safely housed General Eisenhower after his arrival in Britain and was the focal point of Churchill's new alliance with America. For two years, Britain had fought the war on its own. But after Pearl Harbor, Churchill wanted to build that special relationship with Roosevelt into something which was a political and strategic plan to defeat Germany, Japan, and Italy. To do that, he needed to build that informal relationship into something where he could have access to the president day in, day out. Eisenhower was the key to Britain and America fighting a successful war as allies. He set up his headquarters in the shadow of the U.S. Embassy in Grosvenor Square, but intelligence reports in 1942 suggested that the Allied Supreme Commander would not be safe there. Germany had developed lethal new rocket weapons. Soon they would be able to release them on London. The effect would be devastating. The V1 was the first of the German revenge weapons. It was, in all essence, an unguided aircraft. It used a pulse jet engine for propulsion. It carried a warhead of around about one ton. It was not enormously accurate, but it was well able to hit a large target like London. We could hear the V1 coming, which led to its distinctive nickname of the Doodlebug. It was vulnerable to being shot down by aircraft, in particular the latest jets. It was also vulnerable to anti-aircraft artillery. That led directly to the development of the V2, its big brother weapon. This only carried the same size warhead as a V1, but its one massive advantage was that we could not hear this weapon coming. It was launched into the Earth's stratosphere and would re-enter after the engine had burnt out. The first indication of a V2 attack would be the explosion as a weapon hit the ground. The massive potential these rockets had for blast and penetration caused great concern amongst Britain's engineers. They feared that London's underground shelters were no longer safe. One effect of detonating occurring deep in the soil, particularly in something like London clay, was that it confines the explosion and thereby intensifies it, makes it much more 
powerful than it would be if the same explosion was to take place in the open at ground level. This pulse of energy, this ground shock wave, rushes out at supersonic speed away from the center of the explosion. So, in a way, London was its own worst enemy, you might say. It, it had soil conditions that allowed bombs to get deep, and also soil that transmitted the, uh, the effects of the explosions very efficiently. With the lethal threat of V weapons hanging overhead, Eisenhower was provided with the first of a new generation of ultra-deep bunkers. With rare permission to gain access, we can reveal the full extent of Ike's London bunker. Pre-war plans to enlarge an underground station close to the American embassy were co-opted, and using established deep tunneling techniques, a tubular bunker was developed. Using a pair of concrete blockhouses, parallel shafts were dug by hand through the London clay. They went to a depth of 120 feet. Small bore access tunnels were then dug away from the shafts before two large tunnels, 16 feet in diameter, were constructed. Again, the work was done by hand. These two larger tunnels provided the main body of the shelter. Divided into two floors, they could accommodate as many as 8,000 people. Eisenhower took possession of his bomb-proof bunker in late 1942. Sixty years later, it remains off-limits and just as impregnable. It is now London's deepest and safest store for confidential documents. It hasn't changed since Eisenhower occupied it. And this is the lift, the lift that Dwight Eisenhower had installed to make sure he was safe in supervising the war effort from this bunker in London. Not only is this one of the most central points for communications, this is one of the deepest points in London. You're 120 feet underground here. There's no way that the personnel can be killed or captured. This becomes the unseen command post, the unseen headquarters for Eisenhower, the rest of the American staff, linking the Americans with their British allies. Eight men from the 318th Special Service Battalion are brought here, working through these tunnels. In 29 days, they put in 1,400 communication lines. In normal conditions, three months. In less than half that time, these eight men set up the vital link that allows Eisenhower to reach out to Churchill and Roosevelt and establish the winning strategy. With sensitive transatlantic telephone lines passing through his bunker, Eisenhower installed Sig Sally, a high-tech voice scrambling system to ensure that conversations were secure. A hotline from the White House was set up to link Roosevelt directly with Churchill in the cabinet war rooms. It was disguised as Churchill's private bathroom. Thanks to Ike's bunker, the president and prime minister enjoyed unbroken and secure communications on a day-to-day -day basis. This tunnel provides the center, the center for what will become the unseen effort to win the war in Europe. Ike's bunker provided a springboard from which he orchestrated the fight back against Hitler. After D-Day, Allied forces pushed into northern France. They captured the airfields and rocket launching sites that had terrorized London. From his secret underground world, Churchill had saved Britain and with General Eisenhower led the Allies to victory in Europe. This lost world has retained its mystery for 60 years. Largely absent from the history books, the secrets of its wartime role are only now giving themselves up. Who knows how much remains classified or to what extent this world of bunkers and tunnels was extended after the war. With the British government facing new threats in the form of nuclear, biological, and chemical weapons and the very real dangers of global terrorism, it is likely that any further secrets under London streets will remain buried for many years to come.